Anyway, um, <laughs> I'd like to introduce this evening's uh, speaker, Adam Sawkins. Adam uh, has worked across a range of different companies in the games industry um, as primarily an audio developer, has worked for um, companies including Criterion Games, Codemasters, um, where he spent several years and has been involved in the development of most of the driving games you've ever come across apart from the Need for Speed franchise. Actually, I was a little bit. Oh, you were a little bit in that as well. Okay. So, okay, most, I'll just just put that down to most of the driving gamers you ever you have ever come across. Um, he left Cody's in 2011 to set up his own independent company, so now operates as an, as an indie developer, and that has included developing Fortress Craft, which is one of the most successful titles ever released on Xbox Live. Um, so, with that, I'll hand over to Adam to tell you what he's going to be talking about. You've literally just ruined the first part of my talk, but just, you, just, just like you just read it. So, uh, hello, I am guest pass number one. So, I'm Adam. Um, I joined the games industry about two decades ago, and in my time, I released well over 100 titles. Um, most of them were racing games, and I primarily focused on audio programming. So, at its very lowest level, audio programming can be thought of as deciding what sound to play, when, how loud, and at what pitch. Now, as you'll discover, hopefully, it's a little bit more complex than that. So I worked on the Burnout Games, Race Driver Grid, Colin McRae Rally, Jericho, DJ Hero, Sonic, Doctor Who, Formula One. I also worked on an awful lot of crap, but we're not gonna go over that. About five years ago, I released Fortress Craft 360 on the Xbox Live indie uh, platform, and it went on to becoming the seventh best-selling digital title on the Xbox 360 and I left my job in the AAA industry to write my own games at that point. And if it's too loud, it's his fault. So I just want to say, putting this talk together has been actually quite interesting. YouTube makes researching and finding videos and this sort of thing really quite fun. And I found myself at midnight about a week ago, um, I found myself, I found a community of people who restore 1930s chainsaws, two straight chainsaws, and then listen to the audio. That's really true. So there might be a bit of some of the weirdness in some of the capture videos. Um, I've discovered that trying to capture footage from a decade old computer game can be a little bit tricky. Anyway, so I'm gonna go over cars, first of all. What they are, how they work, why they make the noise they do, and hopefully instill a little enthusiasm into you about how damned cool, cool the cars are. This is adapted from a talk I would give newbies at Codemasters. We get people in to do audio and they would have no idea how a car works, like literally none at all. The second part of the talk will be how, how we squeeze all of that, uh, all that coolness onto the PlayStation 2 for the Burnout games. So, cars. So who here's got a car? Right, has anyone got a good car? What have you got? I've got a 2013 Volvo D40. A Volvo D40, nice. Yes, yes. Nice, so if anyone hits you, you're not even going to notice it. <laughs> Volvo is invincible. So. I have got an 18-year-old Subaru Impreza. Nice. It is on the screen. So commonly known as Scoobies. Now, because I've got this car, I got roped into doing the intro for Dirt 2, which you can't see. So we recorded that intro with a guy called Mark Knight. 
you probably know of Mark Knight. He did music for stuff like Duke Nukem, Populous 2. He did a whole bunch of stuff. And we recorded the audio for this one using my car. So, three bits there. So the, the middle bit, the car spin, what we did that is I sat in the car park at Cobham and just revved the engine up and down. And he got a microphone and a big boom and just spun it around like that. So it sounds like the car's spinning around. And the bit where it, it's, uh, it, dry, it comes in, what we did is we just found a bit of deserted road out in the countryside and he basically just had a, a microphone there and just recorded me coming to a screeching halt right next to him. And one of the times of doing this, I'm there and I'm waiting for the, the traffic to go, wait for the traffic to go and the uh, guy stops and starts talking to him. I'm like, okay, wait, wait a second. So I did my thing, came to heart. I said, what was that? He goes, well, I was recording and he came back around because he was going a bit fast and he thought I was a policeman with a speed gun. And that last bit as I drove off, that was brilliant. So Mark got down on its knees behind the car in a gravel filled lay-by and I just brought it out to red line, dumped the clutch, covered him in dirt and gravel. This is proper love for our art. Watch those three bits together. And I'm not joking when I say 15 minutes into the day this came out. Someone posted on the phone going, I think you'll find for some mistake that you have gotten a classic super impressive inline four engine on the introduction was everybody knows that Ken Block uses his own custom flat set. I'm like, <laughs> no one told us, no one told us that. So yeah. So one thing that's not gonna come across in this talk is the sheer volume of cars, the sheer loudness. So if anything is a bit loud, just wince or wave and we'll, uh, we'll ride the volume a bit. So we'll start at the heart of the car, the engine. So when you were at school, you were probably taught the four-stroke engine cycle, known as the Otto cycle. So Otto was the guy who founded Mercedes-Benz. If you don't remember that, you might remember slightly hilarious suck, squeeze, bang, blow mnemonic. It's quite simple in practice. Fuel is drawn in, squeezed, exploded, and exhausted. Suck, squeeze, bang, blow. Now, pretty much every non-diesel car in the world uses this. The two exceptions are the two-stroke engine, which as we saw earlier is using chainsaws and hedge trimmers and mopeds and scooters, and the rotary engine. So the rotary engine is used using prop planes because the rotary engine doesn't care which way up it is, so it doesn't get starved of fuel. It's also more recently used in the Mazda RX-8, whose press release states they had almost perfected the technology. Almost. The bang part of this is what we're interested in for the audio. So it really is a bang. We squeeze it we ignite it, the explosion shunts it downwards, and that is what causes the thing to move, and that's what makes the car go forwards. So the vast majority of cars out there today use an inline four setup. So you get four cylinders, and they fire like that, in that order. I don't know why it's one, four, two, three. no one's ever explained it, but that's the order they're in. So, what does it sound like? Not great. So the interesting thing about modern cars is how much sound is dissipated and absorbed by the baffles in the exhaust system. You can't make sound louder unless you add in external energy. You can just make it quieter. So the quieter your car is, the more energy has been expended or wasted in making it quieter. This is why race cars are much, much louder. Wasted energy is lost speed. Now, if we take a very similar car and we stick a big chavvy exhaust on it, it sounds like this. Much better. So, larger, more powerful cars will use an inline six. It doesn't really sound any different. So it should be worth pointing out that cars have not always been quite so refined. So, what I'm about to show you is a 1911 Fiat S76. This has got a 28-litre displacement engine and is colloquially known as the Beast of Turin. 28 litres, that's, that's not a mistake. So this reminds you that cars literally run by exploding dead dinosaurs. So, 
For the car nerds amongst you, that thing was at 300 horsepower. It was rear wheel drive, and you can just see it used a chain to drive the wheel. I think people were a lot braver back then. So, what other options are there? So probably the best known one is the V8. So it's called that because, wait for it, there's eight cylinders in a V shape. It's probably quite well known because it sounds like this. You don't need to see me, just watch that stuff, it's much cooler. So it was favoured in American muscle cars from the 1950 onwards because it's very easy to make a big version of this engine without any cleverness. So you've also got rarer engines like the W12, I think we all know how why that one's called that one, and the Dodge Viper's V10. So the V10 from the Dodge Viper is literally a truck engine they put into it, literally. Um, but if you want to hand something that really, really sounds good, you've got to go to the hypercars engine of choice, which is the V12. Now, it was only when we got to work with Force India um, that we got to record a single F1 car on track and we were quite surprised listening to the recordings because it sounds like there's about a dozen and in race drive again we actually had a system that would actually calculate all the flat areas and actually place reverb zones in real time as you went around because one car does not sound like one at that point it was really surprising so while it's not a car no talk about engines is not going to be complete without touching on the v-twin so it's most commonly used in cruiser motorbikes. So it's got a fantastic sound that I once heard as like Thor gargling hand grenades. So interestingly, Harley Davidson actually tried to copyright their v-twin engine sound and they got the copyright as well and it was only due to honda and suzuki lobbying that they actually got overturned they kind of explained that that's kind of how a v-twin sounds if you just make a cylinder like that and you put a pipe on that that's what it sounds like um harley's at least the american ones are still carburetor based generally not fuel injected so you get that sort of almost stalling gurgly liquid sound Probably most iconic though is the <clears throat> four-cylinder horizontally opposed engine. Now, however hard Subaru tried to get everyone to call it the quadrizontal engine in their bizarre 1970s weird sexist ads. If you can't read that, it's just strange. So it's become known as the boxer engine because, and you need to use a little bit of imagination here, it looks like two boxers hitting each other. That's why it's called the boxer engine. It's pretty much used only in the Subaru Impreza and the Porsche Boxster and it's a unique sounding engine and nothing else quite sounds like it. So I mentioned the reverbs earlier, we were trying to work out quite how much reverb we should expect because in Dirt Rally we actually again had these reverb planes using stereo reverb units and we actually took my car out, again country lanes, we found some stone walls and we booted it through the stone walls while recording it. So you'll hear in this one, you'll hear it get louder. It's not another car, it's not a change of volume, that's literally something there to reflect the audio back at us. And you'll, at the end you'll hear the result of me put my foot flat to the core with, it, with an audio designer in it. And that, and then down again. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So I mentioned earlier that V8 engines do very well without any clever jiggery-pokery. They're enormous engines and they just gulp a lot of air in order to explode a lot of petrol. So you notice the hood scoop on the front of the Impreza there. That's there to cool the turbocharger's intercooler. Right, so turbochargers are brilliant. So, you're gonna to have to imagine this one. So imagine that you've got a tube, and at each end of the tube you've got a fan. So I spin this fan, it'll make some air go down the tube, and the air going down the tube will make this fan spin, which will blow the air out, which will also suck the air in. Now imagine you attach those fans with a rod. So as I spin one, that causes the air to go down, which causes this fan to spin, but that's attached that also causes this one to spin. And if you're familiar with the laws of conservation of energy, you'll realize that it can't go forever. But here's the clever bit. If you heat up the air in the middle, the volume of the air expands. So this fan will end up spinning faster. So this fan will spin faster. So there's more air here and so on and so on. A turbine will spin in the order of 150,000 RPM. And the speed is determined by the relative difference of the coldness of this part and the heat of this part. So basically, you suck cold air in from the bonnet of your car, you heat at the other end from the hot exhaust gases of your car, and you will spin that fan ever so fast for free. It's literally, it's using energy that we would have thrown out of the back of the car as heat. There's a man talking. Brilliant. You're Italian, you're Italian. You've, you've probably got, no? I'm sure he says something great. So, they don't look like that though, they've got this very distinctive Nautilus shape. So, you're all clear on turbos. Now you're all asking me, I'm sure, why do I want to blow air really hard? So, the limiting factor in how much petrol you can burn is pretty much how much oxygen you can get in there. Turbochargers are used in a lot of performance cars and diesels to get a lot of power in a small space. So my Impreza is a two litre car, outputs 330 horsepower. Comparatively, that, that Fiat from earlier, that was 28 litres. But bolting a turbo charger onto a car can easily double the horsepower output. Plus, they sound pretty cool. So, high performance ones get well over a thousand horsepower. actually hit the needle going round. So, as I said, they work amazingly well on small engines. They give small engines a huge boost of power. By small, you know, I'm talking one litre, one and a half litre. So in this next video, keep an eye on the bottom right. So I think that one's a kilometre an hour, but this next video is in miles per hour. You'll also notice as, as we get quite fast, wind noise becomes quite an issue in recording. <laughs> So at this point he realises he's running out of room and he's running out of track and you can't break at 270 miles an hour. Yeah. He reckoned he could have broken 300 if he'd had a longer thing. So that's 0 to 278 miles an hour within a mile. That's not bad for a glorified hairdryer. Hmm? That's a Hayabusa, that's a motorbike. That's a 1.4 litre motorbike. 
So yeah, he's shunting all of that through one tire at the back. It's scary. So, Americans have no truck with turbochargers. They tend to use superchargers in place of that. Mostly, I think, because they just look completely badass. Not very practical though. So there are identical bases to the mechanics. A fan spins really quickly, it sucks air in, blows it into the engine, you set fire to more dinosaur remains. The difference is instead of being a clever thing with heating up and fans and blah blah, that big belt on the front is just attached to the engine. Um, drawback, you lose a couple of percent of power. Bonus, you have full turbo, full supercharged boost all the time. No, no turbo lag, no waiting around for it to spin up. Um, also, they do sound completely brilliant. So if you've been watching the Grand Tour, they did an episode on the Dodge Hellcat when Richard Hammond's face, every time he puts his foot down, you hear that supercharger engage and he just grinned and they're, they're awesome. The interesting thing is, the only real limit is how much air you can stick in the cylinders before they blow up. That noise you can hear, that's all the car alarms in the car park going off. <laughs> so that's the first one of the day. You can see people. So after that, there's a little announcement going, yeah, can you all go and turn your car alarms off? Otherwise, after every single race, those cars displace enough air so all the cars think that someone's breaking into them. Of course, you have to leave it to the Australians to uh, externally mount two turbochargers to the bonnet in complete defiance of common sense. Okay, so still with me? We've got our engine working away, spinning a bit of metal that I'm probably getting correctly called the crankshaft, and it then connects to your gearbox. Now gearboxes are dead easy, much easier to explain. You've all ridden push bikes, you understand the idea. You've got one cog at this end, one cog at that end, you choose a pair of them, and that determines your drive ratio. So you, simple as that. You generally, you won't hear the gearbox on a road car, but on a race car, you want as much performance as you can. And that means giving yourself as much surface area as you can on the gears. So, um, your road car will have a spiral bevel gearbox and that has less surface area, but it's much easier to engage and it's silent. The straight cut gearbox, they're straight, but you have much more surface area on the teeth so you can shove more power through them. Couple of drawbacks, one, it's incredibly loud, and two, it wears away quite quickly. Now, for no reason I've ever worked out, classic minis all use straight cut gears. Reverse uses a straight cut gear. If you drive a car backwards, you'll hear that That's a straight cut gear. But minis, all their gears are straight cut. I don't know why. So, when I was working on Race Driver Grid, I had a, a directive from further up saying they wanted to make the game as realistic as possible. And I said, that's not a good idea. They're like, no, no, we want it to be as realistic as we can. And I'm like, well, that's a bad idea. And they're like, no, no. So I showed them this video. Now, again, wince if it's a bit loud. This one's a bit painful. But this is a recording from inside of a touring car. <laughs> So 
So that's literally what the inside of a race car sounds like. And there's a reason they wear earplugs. After showing that video, it was decided that perhaps we didn't want the game to sound exactly like a real <laughs> race car, just kind of what people might think a real race car sounds like. Okay, so the prop shaft comes out the back of the gearbox, and then you have a differential where it puts the power to the wheels. That is all pretty boring. And more importantly, it's quiet. That then attaches to the axle, which makes the rear wheels spin round. Done. But in between the road and the wheels is what's called the tyre. And tyres are something that I have spent half my life simulating. It's a bit less exciting than the dinosaur explosions though, so I'll be brief. So tyres work through friction on a pair of different axes, and that can be broken down into a number of states. So rolling is the easiest one. Um, interestingly, all the videos I cannot find just a boring sound of a car driving along. You've all heard that, it's just kind of a, a boring noise. So, if the wheel is travelling faster than the car is, no, the wheel is spinning faster than the car is travelling, you'll get what's called peeling, also known as wheel spinning or burnout. So that's an electric car. Um, I really wish we'd had access to things like that when we're doing skid recordings. We generally try and use front engine cars with rear wheel drive to try and minimise the amount of engine noise, but it would have been lovely to have access to those sort of things. So if the wheel is sliding slower than the road, then that's referred to, sorry, if the wheel is spinning slower than the road, that's referred to as sliding. Accidentally putting on the handbrake whilst driving along will give you this effect, or if you're driving a car without ABS. If you're going around a corner, you're asking for friction from the tyre in a different direction. And if you're inside the friction envelope, nothing will happen. Once you're turning harder, the tyre walls will begin to deflect. And once they've accumulated enough force, they'll, I hope you can see me here, they'll snap back to the right position, and then they'll start to deflect again. Now that's called scrubbing. And that's the kind of the sound you hear if you're going round and round about a little bit too quickly. Each snap of the tyre back to its right position will cause a little chirrup. Now, if you ignore the scrubbing and go faster and faster and faster, you'll end up skidding. Now, I have no idea why this video exists, but it is the absolute perfect video to demonstrate this. I don't know why someone did this, but it's perfect. So hopefully you can see the tire moves away from sort of straight as you ask it for sideways forces. So bikes, bikes work completely differently. Maybe next time. I'll give you two bits of advice. Never ever buy a car with gold wheels. You will spend your whole life cleaning them. And if your check engine light comes on. If your check engine light is on. Mm-hmm. Typically that's an indicator to, you know, check your engine. It's fine, it's been on for like a month. Well actually that would be all the more reason to, you know, Check your engine. So, that's a very brief look about how cars work and why they make a noise. Now, if you've been inspired to go out and make your own car, please note that I've missed out a whole bunch of important things like suspension and brakes and steering. They don't make any sound though. But the fun part comes when you get all of those things and you put them together and you've got yourself a hopefully great sounding game. So, who's got a phone? It's not for a question. Right, who's got the worst phone? No, okay, okay, so I've got here, I've got a middle of the road, year old iPhone 4, iPhone SE. It's got a gigabyte of RAM, 
It's got 128 gigabytes of on-tap storage. A quad thread processor running 1.85 gigahertz it is a monster of a device. When I first entered the games industry, we were just leaving behind PlayStation 1. That's it. That's how games looked when I joined the games industry, like that. Now, my phone has a thousand times more RAM than the PlayStation 1. Thousand. Now, thankfully, of course, when I'm, when I'm talking about this bot, the game, I'm talking about PlayStation 2 era. It's 2001, next gen, 32 megs of RAM, dedicated vector units. That's a picture. Now, I have no idea what they were smoking when they designed this. It's insane. So you've got the Emotion Engine, and that's their fancy name for a Toshiba MIPS processor, because it could simulate emotions. That was their actual broadsheet for when we got these things. It's a 300 megahertz single core processor. It's got 32 megs of RAM. It's got a pair of vector units for drawing, and that can then decode MPEG. Hang on, so, and then you've, this thing is crazy. This thing is horrible. There's a reason the Xbox did so well compared to this horrible thing. The worst part is the audio. The audio is literally two PlayStation 1 audio chips bolted together with a signal path between them. I'm literally not joking. Each of those sound processing units, SPUs, had 24 voices and one reverb, 24 voices and another reverb, and you put it in. So if reverb happened on this one, it reverbed everything from this one. It was insane. So if you've played a shooter game, when it gets all muffled and indistinct when you're on low health. So we figured out a trick on the PlayStation 2 to use the wet return on the reverb unit, but not the reverb part. So what it is, we could filter all the sounds, but without any reverb, and we could filter it with resonance. So it meant that when you got low health, everything kind of came in a bit. So the buzzing there is because I had to record this on an emulation of an old press. It doesn't quite work. So in my entire time in the games industry, I think that's my only unique contribution was that trick of sweeping in a low pass filter as you lost health. Now, it did mean that we were limited to 24 filtered voices and a couple of unfiltered for HUD music. So on, the, on this game, we literally threw away half our playing voice capacity in order to get that effect in. So, back to this. So, you had two vector units, you had the graphic synthesizer, and, and I'm not joking, this thing was a disaster program for. It acted like 12 separate computers that you had to send packets to, almost like they were on the internet. It was horrible. Now, my iPhone might be 100 times faster and bigger, but the layout's like this. CPU, RAM, sorry, RAM, CPU, GPU, done. That's it. So the PS2 was a crazy fast machine for its time, but that came with so much complexity that a lot of studios really, really struggled with it. The Xbox, much, much simpler. Again, RAM, CPU, GPU, done. Thankfully, that criterion, we had the Renderware team in the same building, and they were some of the cleverest people that have ever put fingers to keyboards. So on Burnout 3 and Burnout Revenge, and that's as in one, two, three, revenge, we were aiming to be the very best we could be and definitely to do better than Need for Speed. So Burnout 3 is widely regarded as the most optimized game ever made. We hit every bus and pushed every single one of those CPUs to 97% usage. There was nothing left in the poor console. When Sony came to do the PlayStation 3 and they had the emulation of the PlayStation 2 on the PlayStation 3, they used Burnout 3 as their test program because it was the best one. So. We were based on renderware tech, and that's the same stuff that pushed GTA 3 into fame. And this left us do some very interesting tricks. So, first of all, the horrifying number. PS2 has no psychoacoustic codex, no MP3, no org, no, no Vorbis, nothing like that. So even with clever compression and lowered sample rates, we had room for 74 seconds of audio. That's it. Everything had to fit in there. Everything. So from that, we already lost a whole bunch of seconds for disc streaming, things like music. But our goal was to write a game that the average person couldn't complete in 10 days. So the reason for this was at the time, game had a 10-day money-back guarantee. 
That is genuinely the reason the game was designed for that length. If you ever play Burnout 3, again, you'll notice at the end of it, it gets quite stretched out and there's some quite long championships and that was literally the design reason. So the career mode can be beaten in less than 10 hours, but we reckon that most players were probably going to be doing it in sort of the 20 hour mark. And we were getting very worried from the audio point of view that those 74 seconds were going to get heard a lot and very, very boring and we needed to eke it out. So one of the cool innovations was that of a pre-queued stream. We'd hold just enough in memory of a disc stream to start playing, but by the time you got to the end of the buffer, we pulled in the next chunk off disc and we can immediately start playing it. Now we knew that the longest a crash was allowed to be in Burnout was 30 seconds. That's 30 seconds for those streams. And then you had a slow-mo version and a full speed version. So that was theoretically, that would have been 60 seconds of our 74 second of budget just on two sound effects. Hence why we streamed them. We could also stream them at 44 kilohertz, which again, at the time was unheard of. The most of the game was between 12 and 22 kilohertz for the samples. And pretty much only glass was at 22 kilohertz. Everything else, 16 or lower, but those were up 44 kilohertz. Now, the cunning thing was we hooked into how the game worked. So in Burnout, when you crashed and you respawned, you were invincible for three seconds. You could not crash in those three seconds no matter what. And we'd use that period to queue up another crash stream, pull in a complete replacement set of crash banks. So if memory serves, we had 10 slow streams, 10 fast streams, and 10 crash banks. The crash banks would have been probably about 800K and would have contained a couple of hundred crash sound effects. So that meant instead of there being a hundred or so different potential crash sounds, we had many, many, many thousands of different crash sounds. So hopefully you're hearing that every crash sounds different. I mean, they all sound like a car crash, but they all sound a bit different. And again, for the time, on such a tiny, tiny machine that was so woefully underpowered by today's standards, it was quite a jump forwards. So we use these clever preload techniques across the whole game to make the loading and the whole experience feel much, much more seamless. So if you're on the track select screen, you hover over a track, we just start loading that track. And if you go down to the next track, we chucked away all the work we did and we just started on the next one. Now, it took us a while to get out of this mindset of wasted time, but it's a computer. Don't get tired doesn't get happy, doesn't get sad, it just runs programs. But this meant if you hovered over a track for a couple of seconds and went, yeah, let's have that one, you'd saved yourself two seconds of loading. Same on the car, um, exactly the same technique. So this meant if you can, we had loading times of three to seven seconds. Now, if you compare that to modern loading times, the one I've got here is Battlefield 1 takes 74 seconds to load on some of the levels on the PS4. This is horrible. So at the start of the race, we would pan over the cars. Now, I'll show you it in a sec. So this pan is looking downwards, and the length of the pan is determined by how long it takes to load the tracks. So we load the cars, we load the very first part of the track, and then we have a very minimal set of camera data, and then we can look up and, and show that. So you can see that it's looking backwards down the track and at that point we're loading stuff in front of it. So if it took longer, that camera would pan slower. And though that looks like a fancy pants introduction, but it's actually a loading screen. And these machines, again, they were so slow, 
compared to modern machines and we really did our best to sort of uh, squeeze everything out. So another little neat trick that uh, Sean Murray of No Man's Sky fame and I, we implemented for the unlock screen. He was one of the juniors at Criteria at the time. So we've got, I'll show you the sequence in a second, you've got a guitar build and that guitar build is the loading. As soon as we finish loading, we get a drum fill and we'll switch across to the other piece of music. So this meant that you, it never felt like you were waiting. It felt like you were, things were happening immediately. And Sean was actually quite worried because in theory, in theory that drum fill, I think it was a 30 second drum fill, just a, uh, just a guitar build, sorry, just a 30 seconds. So in theory, if your drive was dirty, the camera would just continue to pan across the garage and across the garage. And if it still didn't load, eventually the camera would just go through the wall and just fly <laughs> off forever. But, and Sean was quite worried, but I, I pointed out, they've really got more, they've got more bigger things to worry about than that at this point. So one of the unique challenges of the burnout games was the boost system. So a real car, apart from that higher booster, might take quite a long time to get up to top speed and they tend to slow down for corners. A burnout car hits full speed in a couple of seconds and it sits there for several minutes. So to counter this, we used a variation on the shepherd wrist tone. It's very simple to draw and a bit harder to wave my arms about. So you've got a sound and it goes up in pitch. And then you just make its volume go up like that. So when it's at zero pitch, it's at full volume. And when it's plus one octave, it's silent. And when it's minus one octave, it's silent. And then you have another sound here, an octave up, playing it the same, another sound there. So what happens is your brain will, about three quarters of the way down this, your brain will lock onto the next one. But because it's an exact octave down, you won't notice it doing so. So it sounds like it's going up, and it still sounds like it's going up, but by this point it should be really high, but it's not. It's still going up, and it's still going up, and it's still going up. If you played Mario 64, they had a piano in a tower that used this same trick. Again, you didn't notice it, but you can hear that. It's still going up, it's still going up. So unfortunately, I don't have access to the burnout's assets from these days, but we had about a dozen pitch match loops. So the sound continually morphed as you boosted around. Now, uh, the Shepherd Risset tone. So what I'll show you here is, is about, about a minute of driving, but try and listen to the, the boost burning up. You'll, you'll hear it growing and, and pushing up. So I would love to have done a version with just that sound isolated, but I don't have access to the code. This is... Uh, 15 years ago or something. You just hear it here going up. Okay, no, the speedo is definitely 180. So hopefully you could just about pick it out from all the swooshes in there. So usually when you're in audio, you have a very hard time persuading the artists to help. They love making things look good, but when it comes to things like that's concrete and that's grass and you need to tag that's concrete and that's grass so the footsteps sound different, they're not interested. Burnout had a lot of very low bridges, overpasses and signs, and the closer something is to the camera, the quicker, the faster it appears to be going. And if there's a sound effect that matches up with that, it becomes a lot more convincing effect. Once we got the artists on board, they went crazy with this. Loads of trigger boxes, triggering off all the switches. And on that particular one, Dave Flynn, he totally overdid it. But that, that's fine. So one thing that we worked really, really, really hard on in the game was the dynamic range. Um, the general rule of thumb, 
please don't correct me if I'm wrong, I probably am now these days, was that the loudest thing in a film should be zero dB and talking should be minus 18 dB. So you've got 18 dB of dynamic range. That was what we worked to. So we applied that to burnout. So driving, normal driving is about minus 18 dB and crashes were zero. Now, the, when I took the first test build home and I cranked it up and I played it, it sounded great. Right until I crashed. And then it was perhaps the loudest noise I have ever heard in my life. And I swear my neighbors thought I had actually crashed a car into my house. So that is part of the reason that Black got such excellent reviews. We never presented it anything less than proper volume. Proper, this is a gunshot volume. You know, the journalists were like, whoa, that sounds amazing. And we were like, just sounds loud. And so, as I said earlier, that, that's the point where we realized that people can't really differentiate between very, very loud things and very, very cool things. But that really helped us. And it was the only game I've ever worked on or read about where the audio was mentioned in the previews because we only demonstrated it in controlled circumstances. Ben Minter and I, we spent a huge amount of time trying to design the audio balance system right down. So when you go around a corner, the engines come down a bit to give a little bit more room for the skids to come up. Um, he's working now at DICE. He works on the Battlefield series of games. If you ever get a chance to catch his talk on how the Battlefield dynamic mixer works, do so. It is a fantastic and amazing system. And finally, just one little note on the little bit of polish that nobody ever notices. So when you choose the color of your car and burnout, we wanted a feedback to the player that they pressed the button. And we knew that we wanted it to be a sort of a spray can sound, but we didn't know how many times the player would jab the button. If you just go, tss, 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 it sounded rubbish. So what we do is if you keep jabbing the button, we loop the rattling ball sound until the player's made their mind up. And then only when they've chosen their car does the, player, the sound play. So all those techniques came together to write what many regard as the best looking, best sounding and best playing arcade racer ever made. It's certainly the game that I'm most proud of working on. So that's it, you can all go now. Or you can ask me questions, I don't mind. I think we've got about 20 minutes before I have to get train or something. Oh, there's loads, let me turn the light on. <laughs> so I was turning it down, but I think the speakers at the back didn't go down when, so if anyone, I think you I were wincing a bit, so, okay. People were waving at me. <clears throat> I just, uh... Very quick question, just based on the demo we just saw there. Mm -hmm. uh, the vinyl slowdown effect when you crash, was that real-time effect or yep. baked? we pitched down all the sounds. So that was one of the things we were super happy about, is they all sounded different. Um, there was, I think, I, we played in a very tiny sound. There was always something high-pitched going on, but that was grabbing the entire sound back, pitching all the voices down, and then pitching them back up again. Good spot. Um, hello. Uh, this is more like a general question. What do you think about video games that are now um, getting more into uh, using surround sound in the gameplay? For example, like Star Wars Battlefront. Uh, I think the new Battlefield also uses surround sound. Um, how does how has that been implied more throughout this time? You know, with new games coming up. Um, how how do they do that exactly? Is it more a longer process of of making or? Okay. Um, not really is the answer. When you're creating the game, you position the sounds in 3D space. You know, I'm here. You're three meters ahead and four meters right. We just played the sound there. Um, if you've got a stereo system, we might reduce the volume of it. If it's behind you, we might not. You know, that's taken care of at a sort of a lower level. So we just kind of 
at our level, we're completely agnostic to what the surround system is. Usually, um, Burnout 2 was the first ProLogic, ProLogic 1, ProLogic 2, one of them, one of the first ProLogic games. We had Dolby in, we actually had a 5.1 studio. It was the first custom built 5.1 studio in the UK. And in that one, we actually had to do something special. Um, if a sound effect went through the camera, or very close to it, you get a horrible snap. So we had to bring sound effects down to, to, from above, sound effects down, the sound effects had to go around this bubble so it panned nicely. Other than that, we never really did anything special. I, I never have. Because the problem is, I were at my mate's house and I sat down and I was like, where are your rear speakers? He goes, oh, I put them on the front. I'm like, okay. <laughs> and then another time we went, so we used to do these home tests. We'd go around people's houses and we'd play at their house. And Gav, the, uh, the head honcho at uh, Codemasters, he came back, he went off with, with my lead and Mark and he came and he was flaming at me going, it sounds so shit, we've tried it there, it's crap, it's all weak, it has no bass, what's going, what have you, you fucking, I'm like, has, uh, has Gav plugged his subwoofer back in? He's like, what? Well, when I went there, his subwoofer was in the kitchen with a cloth on it. Because he, he had tinnitus, he didn't like bassy noises and he's like, and Mark went, <laughs> so what we found is with the best will in the world, if someone is playing on an actual pair of stereo speakers, you consider yourself very lucky. Most people will be playing on the television or a soundbar, or they've got a 5-1 system, but the center speaker's over there and they haven't hooked it up. And like, I've got a 5-1 system, but I don't have anywhere to put the rear speakers. I'd have to like take them out and put them in the middle of my living room. It's unfortunately a very impractical thing. Um, all of the, my Codemasters games had 7-1 ambisonic support all built in, and we had a big argument about do we want pair of speakers, pair of speakers, pair of speakers, <coughs> or do we want pair of speakers, pair of speakers, and then an above and a below? Because in a first person shooter, an above and a below probably does you better. And then we kind of realized pretty much no one's got these fancy pants setups. And when we did um, oh, mobile game, I forgot that, we did a mobile game and we actually <coughs> did data mining. We found that virtually no one was playing with the sound on. No one, no one had headphones on, no one had the sound turned up. They weren't listening to it and we were like, we put a lot of effort into it and we realized that a bit of music, a few sound effects, that was probably good enough. It depends on the game. If you're doing a racing game, you need that. You can't tell, you don't want to look down, you want to just hear all the time, how's the car doing? Is it skidding? And when we actually work on the skid audio, all of that, we want to make sure that feeds back. Are you <coughs> at the limit of the grip? Are you way past the grip? You know, all of that feeds back. If you're playing Clash of Clans or something, it doesn't make it sound like it's audio or not. So to answer, no, we never did anything special, and the public are useless. Uh, so uh, when you're working typically, how large is your team, or is it really only you for the most part? What, these days? Sure. Oh, it's just me. Yeah, it's just me. I've got a, a lovely bloke in Ohio who does my art for me, mm. and I have a, a Brighton student who does my 3D modeling. Everything else is done by me. Um, the other end, Black, was the biggest team I think I worked on. That was about 150 people. So 150 people is still fairly small. So Assassin's Creed is insane. It's like two and a half thousand people in about 15 countries. So 150 people was the point where at the end of the game, we got our signed copies of the game, our copies of the game, and we get them signed. So we'd, we'd take the covers out and we'd go around and we'd say hello to all the people we'd work with and get them signed. And that's when I realized I only knew about a quarter of the team by, by basically, oh, who are you? oh, you did the sniper stuff. Oh, I did the audio. We talk via email a lot, but I've never actually met you. We were in two buildings on three floors at that, that point. Um, and that's not, 150 is not that big a team these days. So to, just to follow up then, uh, is, how many of those 150 would be uh, audio guys? Um, let's think about Black. So on Black, we had five, well, we had four programmers, and then what EA called a technical designer. So a technical designer would own a system. So um, let's say tanks. That means you would design how tanks work, you'd source the audio, would call the audio, implement the audio, and do all the programming. You would completely own a system. That's quite unusual. So we had four regular programmers, a technical designer, and then we had uh, five, five sound designers, plus a guy in Australia who recorded most of the guns, because it's quite hard to record guns. It's quite hard to record guns in this country, but. Recording guns is a very, very difficult thing because if you've ever heard a real gun, mm -hmm. if a gun went off out there, you'd be like, is that firework? Like, they don't sound like they do in films. They sound awful. They're just this little, quite loud, but just a little crack, very short sound. 
Um, and then we also use Technicolor, which is, God knows how many people work at Technicolor, but Technicolor, we would say to them, you know, we need tank treads. They'd go out and they'd find a tank and they'd actually record like tank treads for us. So yeah, so in that one, it was, it was five, five programmy types, five or six designery types, about that 10. Um, so what's, I don't know what that is, a percentage, one fifteenth. And is that normally the smallest part of a development team or is, the, is it, uh, you're still sort of really integrated into the overall? If you work on a game and it has a dedicated audio programmer, that's quite unusual, unfortunately. Um, I ended up, so I worked on Jericho, I ended up basically being seconded in because they didn't have an audio programmer. I spent six weeks of hell on that game, getting it from broken to shippable quality. Um, usually, audio is kind, you'll have a designer, almost always you'll have an audio designer, and he's there going, I need someone to implement this code for me. And it's got better. I mean, everywhere I've worked, as an audio guy, I have championed <laughs> bigger department, dedicated room. Again, I'm on the shop floor listening to stuff on headphones, going, well, it sounds great on headphones. Put it on TV, can you turn it down? I'm like, but I don't know how it sounds on a television. Um, things like that. Um, it's got better. So everywhere we've worked, we've, 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 we've championed that cause and just say, look, we, you, know, you need a dedicated audio guy. When I was at Sumo, I was, I was, well, I was, quite, I was managing oh God, 20, 20 something projects that I was managing all at once. And I couldn't do anything on them. And half of them didn't have an audio guy. I would be like, well, who's doing audio? Oh, oh, John's down for it for these two weeks. So then John would do, do something. And then Fred would be on for the next one. So it was horrible. The more people we can get doing audio programming, more people dedicated on that, the better games are going to sound. Uh, sorry, just as a last thing, mm. when you're hiring yourself uh, an audio guy, what do you look for in terms of their experience or knowledge? Passion. We look for passion. Um, so when we were, um, part of the interview process of Burnout was an interesting one because when Burnout 3 came out, it was 97% uh, Metacritic. It was, it was so, so high and we, we could be picky. So one of the things I did during the interview, we hired a PSP and import PSP on my desk. And if they didn't go, is that PSP? That's an immediate, not particularly interested. If they don't vocalize sound effects at any point in the interview, that was always one. <coughs> so we, one of the questions we'd always say to people going, oh, so you know, what's a, what, what, what cool sound effects have you heard in films? And this one guy went, I haven't really watched much films since, uh, since you know, I haven't really played many games since I got married. Okay, well, what about films? Uh, I haven't really watched many films since I got married. Okay, well, TV. I was like, oh, I haven't really watched much TV since I got married. I'm like, what have you been doing? <laughs> And um, on Black, we had a girl called Joanna, or or Joanna Orland join. And her one was from uh, a Thousand Flying Daggers. There's a sequence with all these, and uh, she's blindfolded and she's doing all these drums and it, it's great. Um, but you don't need to be pretentious. Just people go, oh, the lightsaber's from Star Wars. That's fine. You, you, you've got enthusiasm, you've got the passion. If you go, you know, shh, definite tick. Um, what I found is, generally speaking, the people I work with, is you gain experience, you gain knowledge, but you've either got the enthusiasm for it or you don't. And it was one guy I worked with, Yanis, and he, he didn't care about cars. He had no passion for cars at Cove Madison. I took him at Mike and I put my foot, and he heard it, he goes, oh, he goes, he gets, it sounds like a lion purring in the back. And I'm like, yes, it's there, it's there. Yeah. Thank you very much. I'll just nope. pass the mic to someone. Okay. Um, it's just something that interests me um, more about we're doing game audio at the moment and it's just more the implementation and the workflow because obviously when you're doing stuff for film it's quite linear so it's just from beginning to end yep. but with game it's non-linear and what do the audio team do whilst they're creating the game and animations going on and stuff like this? So we get a lot of people coming through to you from the film industry and they're like oh, oh it'd be so easy games would be so easy I'm like Hold on a minute, you've got an hour and a half of completely predictable everything. The burnout had a little bit of predictive audio into it. So what would happen is the cars, you could, I could determine with some probability how long before a given car would ram you. And if it, the probability got high enough, it started to beep its horn. So you got the audio happening before it happened. So if you watched uh, Attack of the Clones, they did this actually in the film. They cut all the audio before the sonic mines went off. And it was that trick of preemptive audio we tried to to get in and it was so difficult because in burnout everything's just all over the bloody place. After that we worked on black and we could do a lot more filmic style preemptive stuff. So we actually got the AI guy, 
he would tell the audio that a sniper shot was going to happen about mm, 400 milliseconds before it happened. So you get this, and then the AI would actually do the instant shot that would explode a gravestone next to you. So you got these little preempted bits. And again, if you've got a, a mortar, you know where it's going to come, you know where it's going to land, you knew it 10 seconds previously. We could actually do some of that preemptive audio. Um, it's very, very hard, but when it works, it's brilliant because you hear it before it happens. You hear it coming, and then you see it and it happens. Again, it's that, it's that Star Wars, it's the Star Destroyer coming over. You hear it, you hear it, and there it is. Um, that was probably the, the, the hardest thing. But when we do cutscenes, it, it's easy. Oh, there's an explosion, cut, drop the audio. You know, we knew when it was coming until someone goes, actually, we're moving that two seconds earlier. That always became a, um, a pain. Do you, do you get like a lot of storyboards and stuff like that as well, or uh, game art and stuff to try and create the sounds? Um, or is it like a last minute thing? So, part of the problem is that EA has ruined definitions. So, beta is now just a glorified demo. So, Colin McRae Dirt, for the first nine months of a 12 month project, you had the car on, a rip on the track, just the track, <coughs> nothing inside. You would literally, 12 feet of tarmac, going for three miles. If you fell off, you fell off forever. There was nothing there. So with that one, we, we struggled. We couldn't, we couldn't have any background audio. We didn't know what was there. Would it be a farm or a windmill? The artists were working, you know, they didn't sort of create stuff in advance. What we, what we find with games is it's about the iteration. You, you put something in, that doesn't work, we'll change it. That doesn't work, we'll change it. That's better. Um, and because of that, you have to become very, very adept. I won't use the word agile, it has a different meaning these days. <coughs> but you have to learn that you'll, you'll do stuff, you'll throw it away. Burnout 4 had a complete system where parts of the cr tracks you go through and you'd hit something and a whole like, building would collapse across. And when you came around for your second lap, there'd be all emergency vehicles there and the building collapsed and you'd divert down a side thing. Now, if you played a uh, split second, was it Blur? Just one of, split, split second. second. That was a whole bunch of ex-Burnout people who went, right, we're putting that idea in. And it didn't work there either. So what we found was, that we, you know, you come around for the second lap and you just plow into the building and all the testers were like, well, it was straight, wasn't it? Oh yeah, but it's changed. And they're like, mm. and that was God, four months, five months of work that we, we threw away because it seemed like a good idea. And it was only when we, and again, if we'd storyboarded it, you know, we had like pit, rough pictures and they'd go, oh, that'd be cool, the building will collapse and it just didn't work. And that's something you need to learn quite quickly is not to be pressed about the work you've done to go, that was cool, doesn't work. And throw it away. It quite, can be quite disheartening. The, for Burnout 4, we use something called Jinsu, which is this system that slices engines up into tiny little um, individual engine cycles. And I spent nine months on that and we didn't use it. So you really, really have to learn just to, to let go. I, I haven't, you can tell with my voice. <laughs> you really have to learn to let go of those things. I was going to ask her, uh, what got you into game audio yourself? So I got into game audio because I joined Climax Brighton and they didn't have any dev kits. Um, now they had test kits, but because as I showed you earlier on that, that horrific diagram that I, I made fun of a lot. Um, so the, the stuff in green was a different, that, the stuff in green is a PlayStation 1. So the audio was all done by a PlayStation 1, but it was kind of, the PlayStation 2 dev kits were a Linux PC in a box, Linux PC, and the PlayStation 2, and the PlayStation 1 would plug into that. So you couldn't debug the PlayStation 1 at all. So if I had a dev kit, I couldn't debug it. If I had a test kit, I still couldn't debug it. So I got a test kit. So they needed someone to do audio, and I'm like, what do I know about audio? I don't, um, yeah, all right, then, you know. My first job in the games industry, I'll, I'll say yes. It turned out that apparently most people didn't spend their sort of teens playing with samplers and modular, uh, mod tracking files and learning how to do audio. Apparently that's not a common thing. So I did know more about audio, but literally I ended up doing audio because they didn't have any dev kits. Um, I, I turned out to be all right at it and I, I turned out to specialize in that. And it's when I realized uh, there's lots and lots and lots of programmers. If you want to be an AI programmer or a physics programmer, you are to a penny. Audio programmers are very, very, very difficult to get hold of, um, even more so with the experienced ones. If I ever decide that indie gaming is not for me, I should be able to go straight back in, more or less anywhere I want, as an audio programmer.
because they didn't have any dev kits. <laughs> uh, for, um, oh, sorry, oh, sorry. Uh, for Burnout, how did they decide what um, like cars to record the audio for? Because they're all unbranded cars, aren't they? Yeah, so we actually so. got a designer for Audi from Honda or Toyota, a lovely bloke called Co. And he was a car designer for, I'll say Toyota, and he would design the cars. And we'd say to him, well, not us, but we would be like, that's a bit too much like a Porsche. Can you make it a little bit less Porsche? And he loved it because in nine months, he had to do 100 cars. And he goes, well, you know, when I work for Toyota, I'd do like one car in five years. This is great. Um, so what we did is we just, again, I've talked about the different engines. We just got as many of each type as we could. You know, inline fours, flat fours, inline sixes, V8s, everything. The whole bunch of different exhausts on. Um, turbocharged, supercharged, we just got everything we could, as much variety as we could, and then try and match what the car looked like. You know, does it look a bit like a Ferrari? Oh, we'll do a V12, something like that. Um, the real problem, as I said, with, without electric cars, it was very hard to record the non-audio stuff, but then trying to record the engine and the exhaust separately is hard. Um, we'd use 13 microphones on the cars, one on the induction, one on the exhaust, big side of the header, an internal one, one in the boot, one on the outside, one by the exhaust contact, which glory. And then we'd, it all be synchronized up, but then some cars would sound good, like the induction would sound great, so oh, that's good, but in other cars, the headers would sound good, so we, we didn't know what would sound good. And some of these cars were very expensive. Um, and it wasn't until we got bought by EA, they actually said to us, we got insurance, right? And we're like, well, yeah, of course we have insurance. What? Because uh, Need for Speed, we're recording a Ferrari and it kind of blew up. <laughs> and we're like, really? <laughs> Brilliant. They were our rivals, they were our rivals. Yeah. But we did have one guy, we were recording, um, it was an Audi Quattro. And Guy popped off to the loo during the dyno run, and there was a bang, and a bonnet goes poof, like this, and we're like, and the bloke comes out, and goes, "What's up? Turbo's gone. Glad I got insurance." <coughs> Bit like this. Hey, what a sound though. Quite easy to. Oh, it sounded great for it blew up. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, just wanted to ask, um, what equipment did you use? Microphones, etc. were in the recording, and also how long did it take to actually do the recording? They go, here's a sound effect. They go, brilliant, it's too big, make it smaller. No, no, no. Um, I don't know. I, I know we use a Diva multi-track recorder, a big hot, solid straight thing, but the designers, that was their world. Microphones, contact mics, condenser mics, the cardio, I don't know, that's, that's totally not my area. All I do know is that they didn't know the answer either. So we did a skateboard game and we ended up with that one. We'd um, pack the, the microphone uh, recorder on top of the deck and then we'd have about six microphones on it, contact microphones underneath it, end up getting destroyed when they grind them and all sorts because we don't know what would come out. Um, when we did black, we recorded some guns and we recorded them onto different things like uh, Sony mini disc and quarter inch tape and all sorts of different things and we found that tape sounded the best so we don't know and the problem is you don't not many people <coughs> record car audio so in these things here you see this massive fan here because the car's not moving it'll overheat really quickly so we have to blow fans in but you can't have the fans on because I mean all we can hear is the fans so we'd have to learn how to run the cars with the fans off for 10 seconds and then blow the fans on and all sorts of things so it's a big learning um, process and unlike you know SciGraph or something there's no big audio programmer or audio designer thing about games it's secretive you are in competition with the only people who know the answer so yeah we used expensive microphones <laughs> and little, little rough round things Chris wants me to finish up okay so just one thing just one thing what's the future what's the future of cars gonna sound like okay racing games in 10 years time are gonna sound shit <laughs> oh, here's tires. Oh, five, three, one, eight, dang. Very, very fast. Sound very boring. So that's it. Thank you for coming. Um,
and wish me luck getting my train.